Hello everyone. We are back in Saturday with again for episode 9. I hope all of you are still happy and healthy. Hi Ibu Lanoke, hi Mas Thomas. How are you? Hello Bu Yusefa. Hello Mas Hello. Thomas. Yeah. I'm great and I hope you too. Um I hope that all of Saturday with friends are also doing well. I cannot believe that we are now in our episode 9 Bu Lanoke and Mas Thomas. And today we have another very special guest with us and he flies directly from Japan because he likes traveling. <laughs> right, Bulanoka? <laughs> yeah, right. So for you, Sefa, we are very honored um, to have Cory Kobe today with us. Cory Kobe is an associate professor at Tezuka Yamaga Queen University, National Business Manager, GILT. Um, program Chair GALT Sendai and one of the executive board members of Extensive Living Foundation, just like the Yusefa. Now let's greet, uh, greet him first. And we also have Mas Thomas today, our beloved um, YouTube editor and our manager. <laughs> Hello, Cory and Mas Thomas. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hello. Hi, Cory. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, it's nighttime here in Japan, as you can see, but I'm good, yeah. Okay, nice to, great. Nice to be here and talk with you. Yeah, great to meet you again here. Okay, yeah. we know that you are very busy at the moment, so we are really thankful that you can make time to be with us today. It's and lovely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Cory, besides what has been mentioned by Ibu Lanoke, could you tell Saturday with friends out there a little bit more about yourself? Ah, oh, about myself. Well, where to start? So <laughs> I've been teaching in Japan for the last 13 years, and I've taught uh, in language school, in high school, and uh, in a couple of different universities here in the country. And as you mentioned, I'm also um, quite involved with um, JALT, the Japan Association for Language uh, Teaching, and uh, as a national business manager in other capacities. And my real passion is for extensive reading. So I'm thrilled to be here and talking with you about it today. Ah, thank you very much, Corey. I miss Japan anyway. So oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did that together. Well, we miss we'd love to have you back, but right now it's not very possible. But oh, yeah. soon. <laughs> soon. Soon. <laughs> soon. So far um, in the previous episodes, we already talked about what ER is, why extensive reading, and how to implement it. Uh, we also mm -hmm. had Professor Richard Day, who talked about his influential books. Um, now our topic for today is related to how to choose the right book for extensive reading. So first of all, could you tell us about your own belief about extensive reading? My own belief about extensive reading. Well, I think that it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, language learners to immerse in the target language. Mm. Uh, for most of the learners, it's impossible for them to live in a, an all English environment. And so extensive reading gives us uh, the opportunity, a lot like movies and music, it gives us the opportunity to immerse in the culture, and the language and the world of English in a way that textbooks and course books just can't. So I'm a huge proponent of uh, the whole experience of extensive reading and what it can offer language learners. Mm. That's true. Um, and we know that actually Japan and Indonesia are similar in a way that we learn English as a foreign language, right? Yeah. Well, so, I'm not so sure about how Indonesia is, but here it's mostly very academic and very intensive without a lot of context. Hmm. So right. we are offered a yeah. completely, completely different approach to the traditional uh, educational approach here in Japan for language. Okay, so could you tell us the general extensive reading implementation in Japan? Like, do you have an ER course in the curriculum or is it integrated in other courses? Well, in my case, I've uh, been involved with three different ER programs, and I'm currently still involved with two at two different universities. Um, at my prior university, where I still manage their ER program, it's a two-year standalone extensive reading curriculum 
within the English department. And so students have a 90 minute class every week that is exclusively related to extensive reading and some, uh, some speed reading and things of that nature as well, but everything related to ER. And um, it's a very well supported, very intensive program. Students have to read 560,000 words minimum to pass the class over the two years. Um, in my new university where I'm at now that you mentioned here in Osaka, uh, it's a little bit less of an intensive uh, program and it's integrated within a general, uh, a general English program, general English curriculum. So it's, uh, I've now got it as 25% uh, of the overall evaluation for one of my courses that lasts for a year. And our target, our ideal target is 200,000 words but the students can get by with around 100,000 and still pass. So it's not quite as intensive as my former program. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a, um, can you tell us when are Japanese students normally introduced with extensive reading, uh, especially reading English books extensively? So there's quite a bit of reading in the um, government curriculum here in Japan, um, but it's all intensive. There isn't anything in the official high school or junior high school curriculum that is extensive reading. There are some private uh, high schools that do have some uh, ER programs, but they're pretty rare. Most Japanese students don't have much experience at all with it uh, up until university. And then if they're studying uh, arts or languages, then many of them do have the opportunity to have some ER but there's not one official curriculum that all students across the country uh, have the opportunity to engage in ER, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'd love to get the government on board with it, but it, yeah. the, that takes a lot of time. Uh, right. But mostly, mostly it's considered a, a, a university pursuit, but there are some rare occasions in language schools, private language schools or private high schools where uh, it is introduced but mainly most of it is practiced at the university level here. Okay, uh, but how actually to manage uh, the implementation of extensive reading? Like I've read uh, Yamashita's uh, article mm -hmm. and some others, and yes. mostly they mentioned that half of the meeting, they use it for like administration and then other uh, lectures or other activities uh, related to curriculum and the, the other half will be for extensive reading. Is that the way? Well, it really depends on that. There are so many different programs, so many different practitioners of ER here. Mm -hmm. There's not one standard or one rule that I can describe as kind of the typical. There's not one typical situation. Each program, each program administrator has their own kind of vision on extensive reading. So my uh, program that is a standalone extensive reading class, basically that class, the main activity in the class is choosing books and reading books. And I take time in those classes to meet individually with each of the students, uh, especially at the beginning, every week. And then slowly, uh, the students that are more independent we don't meet as often, and the students that need more support, I tend to focus on those students. But in that class, it's mostly reading at the beginning. And then gradually we introduce things like speed reading, and uh, there's also a, an activity called Biblio Battles. I'm not sure if you've mm -hmm. heard of that, but that's, a, that's something that we do uh, for in the second year. And uh, it gives the students opportunities to do presentations and compete with mm -hmm. each other uh, on different uh, books that they've read. Mm -hmm. So we start with mostly in-class reading and some out-of-class reading as well, and then gradually reduce the amount of in-class reading and try and get them to read independently outside of class. But that's my own particular philosophy on the ideal uh, extensive reading kind of situation. But we all have to adapt to our different departments, our different mm -hmm curricula so oh, it, it, it there's not one standard unfortunately that's true and also the nature of the students and the nature of the classes too oh right? exactly yeah <laughs> my, my two the two universities i teach at the level is quite different mm. so i have to adapt definitely right okay and how about the book availability for extensive reading in japan Corey? 
Well, you know, in Japan, we're quite blessed. The universities are generally well-funded and we have all of the major publishers here and distributors for all of the major labels. So we have pretty much everything available here. Um, we've also got Amazon, which, um, you know, in Japan is a very, very <laughs> big network. So mm -hmm. we can get we can get English books, you know, within 24, 48 hours, almost wow. anything we want. Wow. And they're pretty reasonable compared to the, the economy. They're not really that expensive. Mm -hmm. I know that right. when you look from a country like Indonesia, the prices in Japan look very high. But considering the salaries and the cost of tuition and things like that, relatively speaking, the books are not that expensive for us. Mm -hmm. So we're quite, we're quite blessed in that regard. But I have some experience dealing with uh, friends who have got programs going in other countries. And I know that mm -hmm. it's quite a struggle to right. access materials. And then if you can, then the costs sometimes can be crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. So, so do, do schools actually uh, prepare the books or the students normally buy the books? Themselves. Typically, it's the program administrator or the library that purchase the books, um, either with department funds or with library funds or with uh, research budget or other things like that. It really depends on the, again, on the particular program. But um, it, it, ideally, it's the, it comes from the department, from within the department um, or the library. If you can get the library to purchase a large collection, that would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah, my, my current university, where I've, where I've just started here, they have over 10,000 graded readers, which, wow. aren't being, which aren't being used right now. They're not being used. That's a heaven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so, so this, is one of my, this is one of my pet projects this year, is to sort through the 10,000 graded readers, figure out which ones I can use as part of my program, uh, because I use the, I use the, um, the M-Reader quizzes, so I'm going to sort the ones that have M-Reader quizzes and the ones that don't. And the ones that don't, I'm going to donate to uh, countries like yours and so to program it. So, <laughs> uh, I've, already, I've already donated over 500 books to a program in Nepal. Uh, I think we had Anne Maeda earlier. And so yeah. I've given over 500 books to Anne. And uh, I'll have at least that many more coming soon. So, wow. yeah. so when those are coming... Soon, remember us. <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah. Yeah, we'll, def we'll definitely have to do something. I'll, yeah. I'll give them to Anne because she's already benefiting, but I'll give them to somebody, one of your listeners, one of your subscribers. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or actually, um, actually, some can go for our extensive reading world congress in Indonesia, and like we can have like book. Uh, quizzes or something like that and we can well we always have a large number of books to give away at the world congress That's which is true. why right. your your subscribers your your viewers should come to the world congress yeah, they have to but we always yeah. we get large book donations from the publishers and right. uh, so we always at the end of the congress we always have a big book giveaway usually hundreds of books yeah. and they so, have to know that the congress will be in indonesia for the next one if you say yeah right. yogyakarta yeah. and yogyakarta so, so yeah, yeah. Right now. <laughs> you have to now, come <laughs> august 9th through 13th 2021 i'm very excited about oh it. wow okay yeah. so yeah. listeners here here <laughs> <laughs> But make, make sure that you subscribe our YouTube channel after this, right, Cory? Of course, of course. Absolutely. All the Maybe. hottest and latest news will come through the YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if the, the Extensive subs Reading Foundation website. That's also a good source for information. That's true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cory, I yeah. have a question, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you have a lot of books, and it seems like it is very fun to be there, I think. So how do you usually uh, your students choose the books that they want to read? Well, the most important thing for me, especially for beginning readers, is for them to choose easy books. That's the most critical factor. Of course, interest is important, but sometimes at the very beginning levels, it's not always possible to find books that you're really engaged with. But the key is to find books that they can read easily, that they understand all or nearly all the vocabulary. 
So the thing that I start with with my orientation for my students, all my students, is to make sure they're choosing easy books. And it's not easy. I have so many students who want to read more difficult books because they're used to that in high school. When they're doing intensive reading, they're not used to understanding more than 75 or 80% of the vocabulary. So telling them that they should understand 95, 98, 100% of the vocabulary, that's really difficult for them to adjust in their minds. So for me, the number one critical factor in choosing a book is understanding the vocabulary in the book and the grammar. So easy, easy is the number one factor. And then, of course, it should be something that they're engaged with, that they, that they enjoy. So I tell my students not to be afraid to put books back that they don't enjoy. So first of all, I teach them how to check the vocabulary, to open a book to the middle and count the number of words on a page that they don't know. And if it passes the vocabulary test, then to start reading it. Read a couple of pages and don't be afraid to put it back. Find something else. We have a lot of books to choose from. We're blessed in that regard. So the key, yeah. the key is to find, first of all, easy at the student's level, because we know our students are at different levels. So something that's at their personal level, and then something that is engaging for them, something interesting. Um, I've done things with uh, genre wheels with my students. Some are really interested in mysteries. Some hate mysteries. Some like romance. Some don't. So it's really individual. So it's the critical thing for students is to become self-aware of their level and their interest and to, and to um, focus on those. But once in a while, take a step outside their comfort zone and try something a bit different to expand their you know, experience. Mm. So um, that's very true. Uh, we have to encourage our students to find the easiest book that they want to read and one that are um, very engaging for them. That, uh, do you have some experiences that when, it's, you know, when your students felt like they did not choose the right book? And then what do you normally do to help your students to choose the right books? Well, first of all, I try and find out what kind of things they're interested in. And um, I'm quite familiar with the library that I have. So um, once I get an idea of the kind of personality that they have, I try and choose books that are sort of uh, oriented towards the kind of people that they are. It's not always easy in a large class, though. But again, in a private university, I'm lucky that I've got relatively small classes mm -hmm. and I can get to know the students. So connecting the, the right material to the right person is really important. Um, so I, I try and take some time. And if they don't enjoy it, I ask them you know, if they enjoyed this book or that book. And then I try and make suggestions in one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. So some, some are into fiction and some aren't. So it just, it really depends on the genre and the style of book. Um, but the, the thing that I've noticed though, is that some students, once they catch on to this concept of easy, mm -hmm. some students will stay at a very easy level and not progress. And it's important to encourage them to read easy, but over time to gradually improve, to increase their level, not to stay static at a particular level. So I've noticed in a lot of the research that um, when students aren't uh, improving their TOEIC or TOEFL or IELTS scores, a lot of time the students aren't reading progressively more challenging material over time. They're reading a lot of words, but they're not improving their actual reading level. So there's gotta be a balance between easy, but a little bit challenging from time to time. They need to have some progression. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. um, so you will, you know, like regularly check on students' progress. How do they read all over the time? Whether they have made some progress on their level? Every week. Yeah. Every week. Yeah. So I have weekly reading targets for all of my programs, mm -hmm. um, for all my classes. So the students have a, a weekly target and a semester target. So every week uh, I structure my, um, my assessment so that each week they can earn some credit just for hitting the target. And mm -hmm. then in the semester, they get credit for a global number of words that they read. Mm -hmm. So I'm really teaching them to, and, and the weekly targets increase every week. 
they go up a little bit, a gentle step, a couple of hundred words more. As they go up in levels, it's 300 words or 400 words more each week so that they, so that they know that they're supposed to read a little more and a little more. But as they read faster, they're not actually spending any more time on task. They ideally, from the beginning to the end, they should spend about the same amount of time on task, but they should be reading faster, so they should be reading more words in a given amount of time. So I manage that very carefully, and not everyone comes along very well, but it's worked. I've had some pretty good success. Last year, I had uh, more than one-third of my students read over a million words wow. in a single year. Yeah. Well, that's so, a lot. Amazing. Yeah, so, so I think a lot of it comes from the enthusiasm of the teacher. I really believe in extensive reading and I'm really enthusiastic. My students know that I'm really into it. And I'm also into the numbers side of it, which for, you know, language students is sometimes a little bit scary, but I try and make the, the numbers approachable and easy to digest. Um, but because of my enthusiasm, I think a lot of my students catch on to the enthusiasm and they, they come along very nicely. Mm. But, but if you don't, I have some colleagues that are doing extensive reading without any enthusiasm and they just don't have the same kind of results. Yeah, that's true. Corey, can yeah. you tell us you know, your target number per week? Uh, well, it depends on the program. <laughs> it ranges anywhere from uh, a very low uh, 2,000 words a week uh, up to 5,000 words a week at the beginning of a semester. Uh, for my advanced uh, fourth semester in a four semester program. And that's the first week. By the end there, I think around 8,500 for the final week or so. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. But the students, easy, the students easily do it. This is the thing with extensive reading. They can read a lot in a short amount of time. If you teach them well and you encourage them, and they gain the confidence and the skills to do it. They can read a lot. I have, I have students that read 20,000, 30,000 words in a week without any challenge, no problem. Yeah, uh, it is possible. That's the key thing. If you believe in them, if you believe it yourself and you believe in them, they will believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. If you set high expectations, I believe that the students will rise to those expectations. Mm -hmm. If you as a teacher don't have high expectations, the students won't you know, exceed those expectations. So encourage them, yeah. That's, that's a very important, powerful point there. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe your stories are really, uh, very inspiring and useful for Indonesian teachers, and especially in those who want to start doing ER independently yeah. yes so i would like to ask your tips especially for efl students on how to choose the right books to read maybe uh sorry how to choose the right books to read yeah especially for the starters well as i said before the key is easy to begin with uh, I, I think it's much better for students to read books below their level and get a lot of experience at the beginning. So I use um, things like the Oxford Reading Tree and things like that for children, like children's kind of stories, so that students, you know, in a, in a single session, in a single class, they can read two or three or four or five books and just get through the stories and they get the confidence. So the, I think the key at the very beginning is to have super easy books so that they're reading a lot of different stories Students aren't used to reading whole books, whole English books. They're reading passages in textbooks a lot. So when they can actually read from cover to cover very easily, they feel a real sense of accomplishment. Even if it only has 100 words or 200 words in the book, there's a sense of accomplishment that they've opened it, cover to cover read it, and then they close it again. So that kind of confidence that they get over time really, really builds. So my students read hundreds of books in a year hundreds but they start out with the super easy ones so that's for me the most important thing is easy at the beginning really easy force the students down and have them believe in the ease the power of ease it's really powerful well thank you so much now how about for the teachers Corey? well as I said before, you know, as far as, as far as choosing the material goes, 
Yeah. So um, I think it's important to choose books that are durable <laughs> because they're going to be read a lot. And uh, my, my experience is that, I mean, I've got books that have, have, have fallen apart and, you know, become quite, uh, quite disintegrated, but they get read, you know, hundred, you know, over a hundred times. Mm. So the, the, I think durable books is a very important thing. Um, and uh, I think that well-written books are also very important. There are some series that are much better written than others. So um, talking with other ER practitioners, looking at some different ER guides. We have a guide here in Japan, published in Japanese, that actually has ratings from uh, student readers. So mm -hmm. we can see if it's got a star, it's very highly uh, prized. If it's got uh, double circle, it's a really good book. If it's got one circle, it's an okay book. If it's got a triangle, it's not a good book. And there's like 15,000 different titles in there. Mm -hmm. So finding the ones that, are, that the readers like, I think is really important. Um, because if the books are boring, the students aren't going to enjoy it. And enjoyment is really important. So yeah, yeah. So for teachers, if you're especially when you're dealing with limited funds, finding yeah. books that are um, that are engaging and that are durable, I think, are really important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. But uh, Cory, I'm actually curious whether we always have to use credit readers for extensive reading, or are there any other sources we can use to do extensive reading? Well, that's a very good question. There are some. Uh, some ER practitioners that believe in only using uh, graded readers, but I actually believe in a combination of graded readers and authentic materials, so-called authentic mm -hmm. materials. I think that um, introducing uh, different book series uh, into your program that native English speakers uh, read, as children especially and as teenagers, I think it helps to broaden the uh, learner experience. So. The critical thing when you're introducing authentic materials is to, is to level them at the correct level. Even though they may look quite uh, juvenile for very young children, they may be very complicated. Things like the Beatrix Potter uh, series, you know, Peter Rabbit. They're, they're, I mean, they're very famous children's tales, but they're very difficult to read. The English is really, really high level. So putting the books, the authentic materials at the correct level is really important. So using something like the um, extensive, uh, extensive reading um, foundation uh, leveling system or some other type of leveling system, even if it's a flesh Kincaid readability scale, something, use some sort of a method so that your, your books are, in, are, 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 are graded by level. So even if they're not a graded reader per se, they, they need to be put in at the right level so that your, your, your learners aren't approaching the books too early. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm a big believer in authentic materials. Big, big believer. Mm. I think yeah. um, it's very important for our listeners to know that now it is not only graded readers, but they can also use some other sources because uh, most of the time we will always think that we have to use graded readers, but then we do not have that. So it, no, uh, it, no. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that there are other, other materials that you can introduce, and they don't even necessarily have to be books. You can have material mm -hmm. such as, uh, you know, stories on blogs or magazines, digital material. There's all kinds of different material out there. Mm -hmm. But the key is that it's, it's leveled in some way. As the program administrator, you need to make sure that the material that you're offering for your students has some sort of a leveling system, that you have leveled it or that it is, has been leveled so that they know they can compare one series to another, one type of book to another, or type of reading material to another. So the, the levels, reading levels are really important so that the student is in their zone. And mm -hmm. if they step out of their zone, they know they've stepped out of their zone. Awesome. So the, the le leveling is really critical. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not just great readers. There's lots of other stuff to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, I believe Indonesian teachers and students learn about how to choose the right materials, not only books now, more mm -hmm. how we are sharing today. No, you're yes. Very yes, Bulan, okay. And also learning from best practices of extensive reading from other countries too, like Japan, right? Mm, yeah, that's right, Yosefa. Well, I cannot wait to implement what you have shared um, to my students, Corey. 
um, before we end our session, um, we have two trivia questions for you. So please oh, answer okay. quickly without <laughs> thinking. <laughs> so the okay. keyword is answer quickly without thinking. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> Only two. The first one. What is your favorite book? My favorite book. Ah. Oh. No thinking. <laughs> uh, too many. Ah. <laughs> uh, a I, lot. I, I'm actually, I, I'm actually a big fan of the Curious George series. I, I'm, uh, I'm a huge, huge. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't pick a favorite. It's like picking a favorite child. But I, I, I love Curious George. I, I, I read Curious George to my students to get them interested in in reading. So yeah, I would say the whole Curious George series for me. It just, it's my childhood. So yeah, yeah. that's okay. interesting. Interesting for me. Yeah. Okay. Question number two. Where yeah. is your favorite spot to read? My favorite spot to read in the bath. I like to read <laughs> a Japanese bath. Yeah, we have, oh, we, have wow. nice, we have nice baths here in Japan. It gets cold here in the winter, and there's it's a real bath culture. So mm -hmm. I like to read. I like to read in the bath, but you have to be careful not to get the books wet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just about to ask you: Are your books waterproof? <laughs> Unfortunately not. And, you know, I've told my students about, about multitasking and I say, look, if you're really busy and you don't have time to read, you can read in the bath, but just don't <laughs> try to inside the bath. So yeah, there you go. Reading in the bath. It's good stuff. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cory, for your answer. We really had fun, but unfortunately, you're very welcome. at our session, um, it's been a great discussion and I'm very thankful for your time. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much, Cory. And we hope to see you again in the future. And yeah. thank you also to all Set the Date with friends for being with us until the end today. We'll see you again next Saturday. Happy uh, Saturday night. Stay happy and healthy. Bye. Bye. See you.